now we have with us uh, um, Sandrine Dudois. Uh, she's a professor of biostatistics and um, statistics and chair of the Strategic Group in Biostatistics at the University of California, Berkeley. Uh, Professor Dudois with the methodological research interests regard high dimensional inference and include exploratory data analysis, visualization, loss based estimation with cross validation, and multiple hypothesis testing. Much of her methodological work is motivated by statistical inferences question arising in biological research and in particular the design and analysis of how to put experiments. Her contributions include exploratory data analysis, normalization and expression quantification, differential expression analysis, class discovery prediction and integration of biological annotations. She's also interested in statistical computing and in particular reproducible research. Uh, she's founding core developer of the Bioconductor project, um, and as you know, an open source and open development software project for the analysis of biomedical and genomic data. Um, Professor Dudo obtained a bachelor's degree uh, and master's degree in mathematics from Carleton University in Ottawa, Canada. She earned her PhD degree in 1999 from the Department of Statistics in UCSC Berkeley under the supervision of Professor Terence P. Speed. And uh, from 1999 to 2000, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Mathematical Science Research Institute in Berkeley. And before joining the faculty at UC Berkeley in July 2001, she underwent a year of postdoctoral training in genomics in the laboratory of Professor Patrick O'Brown in the Department of Biochemistry in Stanford University. So, welcome. Thanks very much, Alejandra. So, um, so good afternoon. Um, well, actually, I'd first like to thank Alejandra for inviting me to back in Toronto. So today I'll tell you a little bit about the work that um, my group has been doing on normalization and differential expression for transcriptome sequencing data. Um, I had a great time working on this project with my postdoc, David Aristo. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, two of our collaborators for motivating our work in this area, John Knight in molecular and cell biology at Berkeley, and Gavin Sherlock in genetics at Stanford. And I'd also like to thank Terry Speed for always very helpful and animated discussions. <laughs> <laughs> um, I won't have time to go through all of this. I, I think most of you are familiar by now with um, anthropoid sequencing, so I'll probably jump right away to the topic of normalization and motivation for um, our work in this area. Then a description of some of the data sets that we've been working on. And then the bulk of the talk will be devoted to between sample normalization. So some results of our exploratory data analysis, presentation of different between sample normalization methods, and then benchmarking of these normalization methods. So what about normalization? Well, in order to derive expression measures and compare these measures between samples for genomic regions, we first need to normalize the read counts to adjust for obvious differences in sequencing depth between lanes and also differences between genomic regions, so genes of different lengths of different GC content. But there are possibly more complex and more subtle technical effects that we we'll might need to adjust for, such as batch library preparation flow cell effects and also nucleotide composition effects like, like GC content <coughs> mappability. So normalization is really essential to make sure that when we see differences in expression measures, either between samples or between genomic regions, these are really due to differences in expression, in transcription, and not technical artifacts. Um, it's still a very important issue, despite initial optimistic claims, like in this paper of 2009, uh, one powerful advantage of RNA-seq is that it can capture transcriptal dynamics across different tissues or conditions without sophisticated normalization of data sets. Um, the subject has received relatively little attention, um, and the merits of the various methods that have been proposed are still unclear because of the lack of comprehensive benchmarking studies and the lack of systematic use of controls, control samples, or sequence. It's still common to use RPKMs, so essentially that's normalizing by total recount and length. Reads per kilobase of Excel models per million map reads. 
although these are PCAM or total CAM normalization, are very problematic. You can lead to bias differential expression results, as I'll show you. And um, they're affected by very few highly expressed genes. So in many cases, we need to account for more complex features of the samples or of the genomic regions. So um, we distinguish between two types of normalizations within sample and between sample normalization. In uh, within sample normalization, we would adjust for gene-specific effects related to length of GC content or methodology. In between sample normalization, we would adjust for effects that are related to distributional differences in read counts between samples, like batch, number, preparation, or flow cell. So a couple of motivating examples. So first, for between sample normalization. Um, here's data from the CQC project, sequencing quality control project. It's a benchmarking data set. We have two different types of samples. Sample A flu, which is UHR, universal human reference RNA, a mixed set of RNA from 10 different tissues, and then red is sample B, that's brain RNA. For each of the two sample types, there were four library preparations, and each library preparation was sequenced on two flow cells in links, so in multiplex as well. Okay, so it read all sample B to blue sample A, different shades corresponds to different library preps. So 64 of sample A, 64 of sample B. Um, these are box plots of gene level log counts, non normalization. So it's actually not too bad, right? It's a pretty similar distributions across samples. Maybe some library preparation effects, right? Here, this blue, dark blue library stands out, but nothing terribly shocking here. Yet, we tried to normalize these data and using different methods, which I'll describe later. And the question, whatever I'm faced with data like that is, all right, I see an effect, but does it matter? And does it matter what method I use to correct for this effect? So this is what this plot here is answering. So for this benchmarking data set for about a thousand gene, we had also PCR measures. So what we did was compare the log full changes between sample A and B from RNA-seq to the log full changes we would get from PCR. And although PCR isn't perfect, we use PCR here as our gold standard. So what we have here are box plots of bias. So the log full change from RNA-seq minus the log full change from PCR for about a dozen gene. And each box plot is for a different normalization method. Okay, so what that tells me is there's an effect. If I try to normalize it different, using different normalization methods, it matters. Okay, so our group the methods here is no normalization. There's a slight bias. Here, these five methods are um, normalization by just a single number for length. Okay, so like total cam normalization or RPCAM. RPCAM would be in red here. Worst bias and no normalization when I normalize by our PCAM. Here are cyclic loss normalization. This is full quantile normalization, so they're nonlinear normalization method. And this is a new method we propose based on factor analysis, remove unwanted variation. Seems to lead to the least bias. And here the box ones that are not colored are we had in the CPC they said we had spike in controls from the external RNA control consortium, ERCC controls. So we thought, okay, these controls are known to have either no differences in expression across the sample or known full changes of expression. So let us base our normalization methods on the controls only. What's terribly shocking here is if we use those controls that are supposed to have known behavior, all that works. Is, okay, we get horrible bias compared to these here. So we'll dive more into these data sets and these normalization methods. In a moment. So the point is there's an effect and it matters how I correct for this effect. And so is it four on the right? This is our UV different versions of our UV. Okay. It's factor analysis using single and rounding the composition. Right. But what's shocking is the control based normalization methods. Okay. Just a quick word, that's all I'll have time to say about within sample normalization methods. So this is data set from the Sherlock lab on yeast. Uh, we're looking at uh, a service CA grown in YPD. 
eight lanes, but from only four library preparations. So four library preparations, two lanes each. These are um, lowest fits of the lot count versus the GC content of a G. We have our eight lanes. They're colored according to library preparation. Okay, there is a pretty clear relationship between lot count and GC content. And the relationship seems to differ between different library preps. Could be the same within library prep. Okay, so I see an effect. Does it matter? Let's move to panel B. So there's no biological differences here. Right? We're looking at, in some sense, biological replicates. We're looking at eight cerevisian lanes grown in white paintings. So what I'm looking here is the lock full change versus GC content for lanes from different library preparations. Okay, so lock full change between two white PD lanes should be centered around zero, right? You expect no differential expression from balance, no differential expression. Here I've stratified the lock full changes of each gene by the GC content. There seems to be a dependence of the lock full change on the GC. So that tells me, well, maybe I need to correct for GC content. That's a topic for another talk in another paper, but I just wanted to alert you to that, that's all. Okay, so between sample normalization then. Before we dive into that, just a few more words about our data sets. So the CQC data set, Sequencing Quality Control Project, is a subset of a big, big, big data set where we're looking at four different types of biological Samples, sample A, which is universal human reference RNA, B is brain RNA. The samples were sequenced at several facilities using different platforms. So 17 facilities around the world and platforms that included Voluminous TySeq 2000, Solid, and Rush 454. We're focusing on the HiSeq sequence at the Australian Genome Research Facility. Um, for each of sample A and B, they have four library preps. They were sequenced in multiplex pools, so eight libraries and eight lanes on each of two flow cells. So that's the design here. Oops. Okay, so four libraries um, for samples of type A, four libraries for samples of type B, multiplex them, two flow cell, eight lanes. So two sample types times four library preps times two flow cells times eight lanes. 128 samples. Um, we like this data set for several reasons. One of them is we had um, external controls from PCR and also microimagers. And also they had spiked in these um, control sequences from the external RNA control consortium, the ERCC. There were 92 spike ins. Um, they were mixing two different um, types of spike in mixes, and the only one was added to sample A and mix two was added to sample B. So that yielded 23 negative controls and 69 positive controls when we were doing the sample A versus B comparison. Another data set which is totally different, which is a real messy data set if you want, from some of our collaborators in the NILAB at Berkeley. They're studying gene expression in the olfactory system of the zebrafish. Um, they were looking here at differential expression between control fish and gallon treated fish. They did experiment using the luminous high seek 2000 or multiplexing. We have three control libraries and three treated libraries. So here's the design. The three libraries, um, the, the six libraries actually were pooled and sequenced in two runs in multiplex. Okay, so we have a total of 12 samples. So two sample types, treated, untreated, three library preps, two runs. This time we also have the um, ERCC spike ins, but only mixed ones. So we only have negative controls. The spike ins should be constantly expressed across our 12 samples. So let's have a look um, at these data then. So first, with our real data set, the zebra fish. So these are uh, bar plots of the per sample number of microids. So the controls here and the treated fish, purple. And 
these are two, the two runs of control fish, control tool one, and the two runs of control three, etc., etc. Okay, so we get high reproducibility and the total read counts between the two runs of the same libraries. So we'll refine our look now at like looking at box plots of gene level counts. All the controls, all the treated. There seems to be systematic differences between libraries, but higher reproducibilities between, uh, between runs for the same library. This is another way to look at the gene level counts, which is more revealing. These are box plots of the gene level relative log expression. The relative log expression um, is the log ratio of a read count for a particular gene to the median count of that gene across samples. So if the samples are similar, you would expect your RLEs to be centered around zero and have roughly the same spread across the samples. So this is not the case. It makes differences between samples more obvious than when you look just at the genome. In particular here, um, library 11 from the treated fish seems to be quite different from the other libraries. Okay, so um, now we're looking at a comparison of biological and technical effects. So these are mean difference plots and d plots of log full changes versus average log expression. And here we're comparing two samples from the same library <coughs> in different runs. Here are, again, two samples from the same library in different runs. And here we're comparing a control library and a treated library, likewise here. So when there are large differences between your samples, you expect a lot of spread on the y-axis, large log full changes in absolute value. So here what's reassuring is you have very little run effects, but you have large treatment effects. So it looks great. It's not so good when we look here at comparing <coughs> control libraries. We have strong library preparation effects that are about the same magnitude as the treated treatment effect. So that's not very good. So um, quick summary of our EPA. The two sequencing runs to extremely high reproducibility, so we'll just pull reads from both runs. So we'll just have three treated and three controlled fish now. Library preparation effects are of the same magnitude as the treatment effects of interest. Um, between sample and noise is needed to account for the different distributions of gene level counts across replicate libraries. So now a quick look at our um, CQC data set using the same types of graphical summaries. So remember we have samples A and B, so UHR and brain, four library preps for each, and multiplex, two flow cells, eight things. So these are bar plots of total counts for samples. So um, seem to be library preparation effects, slight flow cell effects within library preparation effects, but nothing troubling so far. These are box plots of our gene level counts. So again, maybe some library preparation effects within treatment effects. Box plots of the relative log expressions. So if the samples were similar, the box plots would be centered around zero and have the same spread. Here, one library A seems to be a bit different from the rest. Here are these empty plots of log full changes versus average log expression. Here we're comparing samples, the same sample, but in different lanes. Same samples in different flow cells. Different library fronts in the same lane, same flow cell. And here, uh, a sample A and a sample B. So this is an artificial data set. Remember, it's not like our zebrafish data set where we might have several differences between treated and untreated. Here we're comparing brain and UHR, so huge artificial biological differences. So not surprisingly, the biological effect is way bigger than any of the technical effects, but it's still reassuring. 
Okay, so quick summary of this. So biological effects much larger than the technical effects. And that's due to the extreme artificial differential expression between UHR and brain. Among the technical effects, the library prep effects are the largest. Um, library four for sampling appears slightly different from the others. We need between sample normalization again. Uh, just bear in mind that compared to the zebra fish dataset, this is a very artificial dataset. Okay, so now let's take a look at these ERCC spike in control sequences. Let's see if they behave as we wish. So in the zebrafish data set, we have 12 samples. Remember, like three control fish, three good fish, two close samples, two links. So these are um, scanner plots for each of these 12 samples of the log count of one of these control sequences versus the nominal concentration, again, on the log scale. So that looks pretty good, right? Except we get low concentrations. So we're pretty happy with that. Okay, now let's look at something else. That'll be, we're looking at the proportion of reads that map to the control for each of our 12 samples. Based on our protocol, we are told that about 5% of the reads should map to the controls. That's not the case. And the proportion of reads mapping to the control varies between library preps. These are two runs. I reproducibility of the two runs, but there are differences between library preps. So that's not very good. Now we're looking at something else yet. So our 12 samples and our 92 controls. Okay, so each line here corresponds to one of the controls and it's the log count for that control. So I'm checking here one of the controls across my 12 samples and I've grouped the samples so that the treated samples are here and the control samples are here. So these were negative controls. So what would you expect? Horizontal lines, right? At the bottom, these are the low concentration spike in noise. At the top, the higher concentration spike in seem to have systematic effects related to the treatment. That's a bit disturbing. They're negative. Here, not surprisingly, based on that plot, I <coughs> cluster my 12 samples based on only the negative controls, they cluster by treatment. Okay, well, we thought this is a little data set from our calibrators. They're new at the same thing, they're new at using the RCC. Let's see what happened in the hands of the experts of the CQC. Okay, so we're looking at these 92 spiking controls for the CQC data set. This is a subset of the plots of log count versus log concentration in this grade. Now this is bar plots of proportion of reads mapping to the controls. The nominal proportion here should be 2%. Okay, same problem as our little zebra fish data set. All right, now we have mix one and mix two added. So we have here 23, what should be negative controls. So we're looking here at these 23 controls, one line for each. And here, these will be our samples, samples of type A, samples of type B. The negative controls should be flat, horizontal lines here. So again, at low concentration, noise. And here, there seems to be systematic variation of the negative control counts based on the library prep and perhaps the treatment too. These are the positive controls at different concentrations. So for example, here, this, um, these 23 controls should have full change of one to four in sample B to A. Okay, so that's low concentration, just noise. Higher concentration, we do have that sharp drop. It counts. 
It's simple. So it's not too bad, but just here, just noise, even in the hands of the experts. This is pretty troubling. So, um, quick summary, as desired and expected, there's a good linear relationship between read count and concentration, but that's just the wrong display to look at. It's deceiving. It's too optimistic. What we need to look at is the other plots that I showed you. Percentage of reads matching to the control that was highly variable, and it varied between library prep, and it deviated markedly from the nominal value. This was also observed in a recent paper by Shin and colleagues. When we also look at plots of individual counts across sample, we see that the recounts are highly variable, or just noise for low concentration spike in. But they also seem to vary between replicate libraries and treatment groups, even for the negative controls. So that was troubling. Um, we'll try nonetheless to use this control scanner normalization procedure. So these are just results of um, EDA, exploratory data analysis. Now I'll change pace a little bit to give you an overview of normalization methods that we've um, investigated. So this is between sample normalization. The simplest kinds of between sample normalization methods are global scaling normalization methods. So in this case, we just scale the gene level counts by a single factor per sample. The simplest uh, method is global count. That's what's used in the RPCAM. You divide the read counts of each gene by the total count per sample. <coughs> Instead of the total count or RPCAM, you could use the counts for a housekeeping gene, like polar 2 a or you could use a quantile of the count distribution, like the upper quantile. Okay. A slight variant on total count on the global scaling normalization are pairwise global scaling normalization. So in this case, you take the G level counts and you scale them by a single factor per sample that was computed with respect to a reference sample, but it's still one number per sample. Um, this is what's being done in the trim mean of n values, TMM method of Robinson and Oshlack, and also by the um, method of Anderson Huber. Still one order further. This is to be distinguished from nonlinear normalization methods, like full quantile normalization method. Um, in this case, we match all quantiles of the gene count distribution between samples. Another nonlinear method is the last normalization, where you perform robust local regression on a mean difference plot of log counts. I just want to point out something like all these methods are just basic tweaks of what's been done already in microarray normalization methods. Okay, so we have global scaling, we have full quantile normalization, and last normalization. We've also adapted a method that was proposed for microarray data analysis by. Um, Terry Speed and Estun Jan Daniel Barsh. This is RUV for remove on one iteration. So they propose it for microarray normalization method using linear models. So we've adapted it, we've extended it to the generalized linear model framework, which is more suited for counts. Micro measures are viewed as continuous. RNA seq measures are read counts that are modeled either using a Poisson distribution or a more general distribution like negative binomial. So we're viewing this RUV method now within a more general framework that are generalized linear models. So the main idea, let's just get the details here in the interest of time, is we're going to look at the gene level counts for N samples and J genes and model it as follows in terms of two main components. A component of unwanted variation and a component of the variation of interest. Okay. So the variation of interest, if I'm in the CQC setting or in the zebrafish setting, is I want to model the read counts in terms of their expression in the treated and untreated samples. Okay, so I have a design matrix that would reflect whether you're a treated or untreated sample, and I want to measure full changes of expression to infer differential expression between treated and controlled fish. So this is what I care about. But before I can get to this, I have to adjust for things like library preparation effect and maybe unknown effects. So I need to model this unwanted variation. So in this model, the only thing that's known is X, the design matrix that would tell me this is a treated or an untreated sample. 
My parameter of interest here is beta, a full change between treated and untreated samples. These are unknown. Okay, so how do I get a handle on this unwanted variation? Oh, what if I have negative controls? If I have negative controls, all this goes away, so then I can just focus on this part and estimate it by a singular value decomposition. So that's one way to do it. Pick negative control genes, just work on this. Another approach would be to do a first pass differential expression analysis. So ignoring this and just doing differential expression analysis here, using lemma or edge R, whatever you want. Working on residuals to get this. Another approach, which works for the CQC data set, is working within sample A and working within sample B, because then again, I don't have this variation. So I can get a handle on this. These are our three variants of our UE. We're going to use control genes. We're going to use residuals from a first pass um, differential expression analysis. And we can also use replicate samples. Okay, and once we have these sorts of controls, this is just singular value decomposition. decomposition. So um, I have all the details here of the math and all the details in a paper that was just published in um, Nature Biotech. So I'd be happy to answer questions later on. But in the interest of time, let me jump uh, to the results of our comparison. Um, just an old, older result before I show you the article. This is using um, not the CQC data, but the MAQC data from the Microwave Quality Control Project, but they all, also the uh, RMA seek on it. So we're comparing, again, UHI and brain sample, and these are receiver operating characteristic curves, ROC curves. They plot true positive rates versus false positive rates. So the higher the curve, the better the method. So we've compared four methods here for inferring differential expression between brain and UHR. Total count normalization, like RP cam, normalization by full R2A gene, upper quartile normalization, and full quartile normalization. And we've used here PCR as our gold standard. So we had, again, PCR measures for about 1,000 genes. So these are our ROC curves using PCR as gold standard. Two different PCR cutoffs for differential expression. The stringent cutoff are the solid lines, and the dashed lines are a less stringent cutoff. Uh, the point here is that total cam normalization has the lowest ROC curve. Okay, so it's the worst in the sensitivity specificity trade off. Another way to look at this is to look at um, bias in the log fold change between RNA seq and PCR. Total count normalization is the most biased one. Okay, so this is an old comparison. Now let's look at our two new data sets, the zebrafish and the CQC data set. These are box plots of normalized counts on the log seq. So we have each box plot is a different normalization method. In green we have our control fish. And in purple we have our treated fish. So this is total count normalization, upper quartile normalization, upper quartile normalization based only on the controls, the RCC controls. Jim mean of them, Anders and Uber, Loas normalization, Loas using only the controls. Full quantile normalization, not surprisingly, they're all like that, right? And these are the four RUV methods using empirical controls, using the RCC controls, using replicate samples, using residuals. More revealing are box plots of the relative log expression. Okay, so what do we see? If I base my normalization using only the spike in controls, upper quartile normalization is horrible. Cyclic loss normalization is horrible. RUV, not so bad. For some reason, it's pretty robust to the poor behavior of the 
The global scaling normalization methods, so these first four and this one, are less aggressive than full quantile or loss, and less aggressive than RD. That's not surprising because you only have one number that you can play with. Yes? Okay. If I look at the factor of unwanted variation that RUP picks, that's the first singular value. Um, it graphs treatment one and normalizes it. Uh, sorry, library 11 of the treated samples. I see it louder and normalizes that. Okay, so um, now let's look at the local changes between the treated and the controlled fish for all the genes using the different normalization methods. So this is log full change between treated and controlled fish with no normalization. Total count, upper quartile, upper quartile using the RCC controls, treat mean of M values, cyclic glass, uh, sorry, Anderson Uber. This is cyclic glass, cyclic glass using the RCC controls only. Full quantile normalization and the four RUV normalization methods, RUV based on, on the RCC. So, what does that tell me? In this setting, we probably expect most of the genes to be non differentially expressed. So, we'd expect the um, molecular changes to be centered around zero. If I use the ERCC in upper quantile normalization, it indicates that normalization does horrible. <coughs> RUV seems to center the log full changes to zero. So does um, cyclical S and full quantile. The single scale normalization methods don't do quite as well. Now we have these 92 ERCC spiking controls that are negative <coughs> controls. They should be equally abundant and treated and controlled fish. So what we did here is to look at the log full changes between treated and controlled fish for only the ERCC spikes. <coughs> Not surprisingly here, when I look at the spike in and normalize based on the spike in, the full changes are around zero, but everything else looks horrible. Okay, so this is very troubling. Um, now we looked also at p values from EDGAR, negative binomial model, for tests of differential expression between treated and controlled fish. These are all the genes, and these are the negative controlled genes. Negative controlled genes should be not differentially expressed. They should have high p values. Their p values are lower than the p values for the bulk of the genes. So this is very, very, very disturbing. All right, so again, we thought this is a little in-house data sets. They didn't know what they were doing. Let's look at the assets, the CQC. So this all are, each panel here corresponds to a particular um, normalization method. And here we're looking for simplicity at just four samples of um, UHR and four samples of brain. Otherwise, you'd have um, 128 <laughs> box lines in each panel, but the other box lines. Um, RLD is actually more informative. So when I look at normalization methods based only on the RCC, so upper quartile here, cyclic loss, not very good. RUG based on the RCC is okay. So, um, global scaling normalization methods are not as aggressive as cyclic loss or full quantile or RUG. Okay, now let's look at the log full changes between brain and UHR. This is for all the genes, all our different normalization methods. If I look at normalization methods based on the controls, it's very bad for upper core normalization and cyclic loss, not too bad for RUV. If you remember for the CQC data set, we have the, um, the PCR data. So now we're looking at for each normalization method, the box plots of the RNA-seq full change minus the 
the PCR will change. So in some sense, it's box plots of bias, which respects to PCR. Oh, sorry, that's not it. Yeah, let me just backtrack. This is, I'm jumping ahead, but I'll show you that plot. It's the plot here, <laughs> the bias plot. Okay, I was jumping ahead already. So this is box plots of bias, which respects to PCR for each of the normalization methods. When I use only the controls, horrible bias, except for UV. Total count is very biased. Here, these uh, global scaling normalization methods don't do too well. Full count out as well, are UV as well. Because this is biased with respect to PCR. If I compare the estimated minus the nominal fold change for the spikins, then it's just like all over the place, really, really bad. Okay, so let me summarize what we've seen here. So if I ignore the spike ins, just look at the bulk of the genes. For both the zebrafish and the CQC data set, it seems like I need to do some between sample normalization to account for the different distributions of the gene level counts between technical replicate samples, especially due to library preparation. Okay, so there seems to be an effect and I seem to need to correct it. Um, Ignoring the spike ins, the different normalization methods behave as expected in terms of their impacts on the leaf counts and the relative log expression. So the global scaling procedures like total count, upper quartile, true mean of F, and Anderson Weaver are less aggressive than nonlinear methods like full quartile, cyclical S, and RAP. Normalization tends to center the log full change distributions towards zero. The p-value distributions, which I haven't shown you, are also as desired, with a sharp mode at zero that corresponds to differential expression. Um, normalization can have a large impact on differential expression results. And surprisingly, sensitivity can vary more between normalization method than between differential expression. Total count normalization tends to get heavily affected by a relatively small proportion of highly expressed genes, and this can bias the inference of differential expression. The methods that seem to be the most robust are upper quartile, full quartile, and RUV normalization. If I start looking at the spike ins, which I was very happy to have at first, then all hell breaks loose. It seems that normalization introduces bias in multiple change estimation, and it actually decreases the p-value of the negative controls. For the CQC data set, I had the PCR. And when I look at the PCR measures, the assessment of normalization method with respect to PCR is more as expected and seems more reliable. But it's hard to discriminate between methods because this is a very artificial data set with a high differential expression. We're very excited about having these controls because we thought it'd be a great opportunity to use about 100 genes, or sorry, 100 sequences to anchor our normalization methods. But when we try to do this, actually the ERC control lead to very unreliable results. Um, in particular, methods that were found to perform pretty well in global scaling or regression-based normalization don't seem effective anymore, and they lead to uh, highly variable relative log expression and less level changes. Only RUV seemed to perform well when it was based on these controls. Um, so we based our conclusions on two very different data sets, a real data set, which is a deeper fish data set and a more artificial data set. Um, the good linear relationship that we had seen between leaf counts and concentration on a log scale was deceiving, and it did not capture the higher variability of counts across technical samples. So when we looked at these plots, remember the log count versus log concentration, it was just looking at the behaviors of the spike in within sample. I want to use the spike ins across samples, so that's a totally irrelevant display to look at. I want to follow the behaviors of the spike ins across samples. So look at percentage of pathways across samples or the distribution of log counts for the spike ins across samples was a thing to do. And that led to um, 
some troubling observations about their variation with libraries or the transit. Um, so basically, comparing our normalization methods based on the control countered our previous conclusions. And um, the control seems to indicate that no normalization method was better than normalization. So basically, we just skip a lot of this because we're out of time. So our conclusion was these ARCC spike controls were not effective for benchmarking purposes and were not reliable for direct normalization. Uh, Shin and his colleague found similar disturbing results. Um, they also found that there were biases linked to the RNA enrichment protocol, whether they were using poly A or ribosero seemed to matter in terms of the behavior of the spikins. Um, we're very disappointed by these findings with the RCC spiking, but I still believe that it's essential to have control sequences to make sure that we normalize well, that we assess the results of our normalization, and we assess the results of our differential expression results in terms of bias, variance, and type 1 error and power. So I do believe we need controls, so what can be done? Can we improve on the RCC spikings? Are, are there other types of controls that would be more reliable? I'd love to hear your feedback on that, if you've played with ERC spikings or if you've used other controls. Very, very interested in that. Um, also, it was great to have this CQC benchmarking data set, but it was also disappointing to see that people invested so much time and money, and there were obvious design limitations with that big project. Um, they pick really artificially high levels of differential expression between their two samples, and there was no biological replication to assess individual variation. So for example, the types of variation we have between different mice or between different persons. So controls in the end do not replace proper experimental design with taking both in mind. So um, I'll stop with this slide here where um, two of the packages that we've written and used in our analyses. So EDA-seq, for exploratory data analysis and normalization already package, and RUB-seq. This is now that did pretty much all the work. And a whole bunch of other useful packages are um, on the bioconductor website. So I'll stop here, and I thank you very much for your attention.
sequences at different concentrations that span a whole range of expression. That seemed ideal to me as a statistician. If that cover my x-axis of overall expression, I'd cover different range changes. And I thought we could do so many things, so I was extremely happy with that. But then the fact that these controls behave they completely unreliable or counterintuitive in this matter was very disappointing. So um, this is what Shinanoff found as well. So I, I mean, I'm really, really interested. I think we really need controls, and I would love to have better advice on the kinds of controls you can do, whether these ERCC controls are rescuable. Does anyone <laughs> work with these here? Is there anything you can salvage from them? <laughs> so we can take that discussion through the okay. Um, thank you so much for coming.